Warning. The following episode contains subject matter and scenes that some viewers may find upsetting, disturbing, or unnerving. Please note, viewer discretion is advised at all times. Sit back and enjoy. Do you have a lot of nice memories from your childhood? On August 20th, 1989, Lyle and Eric Menendez killed their parents. They were shot? Yeah. As I went into the room, I just started firing. In what direction? In front of me. What was in front of you? My parents. Why did you kill your parents? Because we were afraid. I'm just a normal kid. Oh, Eric, you're a normal kid who killed your parents. Yeah, I know. Welcome back to another I Could Murder a Podcast. I'm Tom Norris and I'm joined by my little buddy boy, Ben Carter. Little buddy boy? Not sure. All right, big old buddy boy. Big old buddy, yeah. Do you Thank want you that? Very much. Yeah, I prefer that. Yeah. Okay, that's yours then. Thank big you boy. so much. Big buddy boy, how you doing, sir? <laughs> very well, how are you? Uh, not too bad, not too bad. New shirt, a uh, medium, but look at this. That's a large medium. That's a large medium. It's like Dan- uh, Derek Akora. Fuck! <laughs> but Ben, before we start, this yeah. is a bloody medium. Bloody? Derek Akura. It's like leopard print to me. For the visual uh, viewers, wearing a new shirt today. Uh, got a medium, but look at it, Ben. If that's a medium, it must have been Derek Akura's. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Because it's b- slightly bigger than a medium should be. But um, yep. what's new with you, Ben? What's new? You're wearing well, a new jumper? Thank you so much. It's Thank you so much for what? Very warm outside. Okay. Um, thank you so much for noticing my new jumper. Um, mistake in this weather. But episode seven of the series, the first time we've ever reached, apart from the seventh episode, that you know, linear, we're getting confused now with numbers, basically. It's officially we've, the longest a series has run. That's exactly where I was trying to land, um, and I landed a few gardens north. Does it feel different, Ben? Something in the air. <laughs> Definitely something in the air. If you haven't already, guys, don't forget to follow us on our socials. We've got Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at at Could Murder a Pod. And this is the uh, the first episode we've done. Obviously, we filmed these in batches. Um, we got a lot of lovely feedback on the Chris Benoit episode, which we weren't really, you know, we knew it was a mixed, mixed, a divisive episode. Um, but as always, keep telling your friends about us um, and keep flying the ICMAP flag. We appreciate it so, so much. The flag is coming to the merch store, actually. No, yes. it's not. But there is a merch store if you are after any merch. Thank you so much for all of the lovely feedback on season three so far, series three so far. We really appreciate it. There's uh, five more episodes coming in the season. But if you can't get enough until then, we have got lots of additional content hiding in plain sight over on our Patreon page, which is patreon.com forward slash could murder a pod. There's lots of cases on there, which you might have seen us post about on our Instagram. They're very interesting little cases. Yeah, and I mean, they've gradually got bigger as well. We started off kind of doing kind of 15 minute long ones. Now there's, um, we've got uh, producer Dan working with us on the, uh, they actually not just uh, in editing, editing format, but he makes a few appearances. So if you want to unmask producer Dan, head over to Patreon. I mean, if that doesn't get them in, I'm not sure what will. What are you thinking, Dan? Yeah, man. <laughs> and there you go <laughs> and also if you're an audio listener why not give us a review on Apple Podcasts or follow us on Spotify Podcasts it really does help us out so this week of course it is it's the case of the Menendez brothers yeah it's, it's uh, a very fascinating case this one it's it's in a a lot of times these cases that we follow and we, we, we cover it's people that grew up maybe in they, they grew up in a poor home they grew up with, with a lot of family struggles but this is Kind of the polar opposite in some respects, and perhaps in others, but we're going to get into that. Uh, this one stands out. They are slightly different, uh, although everyone's different. This this particular case, they do stand out compared to the other subjects we've covered so far. So as we like to start off, we like to do a bit about the family, where, where the brothers grew up and how they, how they grew up, and see if there's any hints along the way in terms of where their life was to lead. 
So the Menendez brothers consist of Eric and Lyle Menendez, who were the children from Jose Enrique Menendez and Kitty Menendez. Should we start with the dad? Let's start with the dad. (laughs) So Jose Enrique Menendez was born in Havana, Cuba. I've always wanted to go there. Just haven't got around to it. Well, hopefully after this lockdown, something you can tick off your list. Hopefully, Tom. There's mixed information about Jose. So some of the documentaries I watched claim that he was kind of a rags to riches, made it to America with the, you know, the change in his pockets. But other uh, documentaries and podcasts that we listen to suggest that he was actually from a very wealthy and successful family. Yeah, I heard he made it. He he, he was from a f- rich family in, in Cuba. Then they lost everything. He's got a fam- he's got a life of a he he would have a lot of money and then and then the revolution happened in Cuba then his family lost all the money again and then that's why he decided he was going to go over to America that that does add up and his his mother this just stood out uh, was a Cuban Hall of Famer for swimming so at the age of sixteen Jose moved over to the U S on a swimming scholarship and he attended the Southern Illinois University where he met his wife Kitty. Um, people said with them growing up that they were both kind of very strikingly good looking people Kitty was a beauty queen and they you know as a couple they very much made sense in the aesthetic yeah and I think that's some a theme that will run with Jose is very much about uh, appearances and uh, the the image of success and I think similar vibe to Kitty as well she wanted to to you know maintain the image of being a, uh, a doting housewife but also uh, you know a loving mother um, but Jose had it I think bred into him um, that success is everything in life and to be an athlete and to be a success to be a businessman um, these are traits that he would very early um, thread into a his... term a lot of people said is he was going for the American dream yeah moving from Cuba to America wanted to work hard become successful live in that big house two kids trophy wife yeah if you want to put her in that that's just that. a term I've not I think it, yeah a lot what to offer them then? Just so the couple they married in 1963 and moved to New York City, where Jose got his accounting degree. So the couple's first son, Joseph Lyle Menendez, who would go by the name Lyle, um, was born on January 10th, 1968. So when this happened, Kitty quit her job teaching and they moved to New Jersey. Yeah, it was from the start a very conflictual relationship. Um, Kitty's family disapproved of uh, Jose because of the fact that he was Cuban. So, a lot of conflict from the off. Very shitty from Kitty. It's a family. Mm-hmm. Not, not Kitty shitty. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> so, in New Jersey, Eric was born on November 27th, 1970. Both brothers attended Princeton Day School. So, Princeton, if you're not aware, um, Princeton and Harvard are very much the, the places to be in America. Maybe you're, maybe you're either your Oxford and Cambridge mm-hmm. equivalent to over here. Maybe Eton. I don't know if it's, if it's in that category, but it's very much... Jose, you know, his dream to give his children what he didn't have, you know, proper education from the, from the off, giving them every advantage he didn't have growing up. Yeah, and Jose, very much to go back to these appearances that he was so fond of, he viewed these boys as his champion thoroughbreds. So these were going to be everything that he had aimed to be, successful, sporty, um, smart, um, affluent. Um, and a success, as hard working as him, he wanted that to be instilled with him from growing up. He wanted them to be in the sports. He wanted them to compete. Um, and this is something that would very much be a part of the, his relationship with the boys. Yeah, he wanted them to be down at the uh, the social club uh, with the old uh, um, Victoria's Secret models on their arms, playing tennis and uh, seeing off a martini. Apparently it was reported that growing up, if the kids came back from school, he would test them on what they've learned that day, sit right close, sit right close, sit really close to their face, ask them questions. If they got them wrong, if they didn't know the answers, he would shake them or shout at them. So he was very, very mm. on their case about their studies, about doing well. And the boys, they, they weren't overly go-getters from an early age. Um, Lyle was very kind of shy. He wasn't as, as cocksure as, as Jose. And with Eric, Eric was very, um, he, he just, He's basically like a normal kid. He, he wanted to hang out with his friends. He wasn't too bothered about schoolwork. Yeah, and there were also rumours that um, Jose and Kitty would also complete the boys' homework for them. Um, so there was, they were returning to school with immaculate homework. And then when they would do a test on site, um, just get yeah, absolutely shoddy. Uh, so Eric absolutely worshipped Lyle, really looked up to his older brother. Unlike most brothers, they rarely fought. Jose then fought, you know, pushes them into a, a, an athlete's lifestyle. And they choose tennis, not just but little tennis. Well, tennis is very much the rich man's golf sport. Well, no, golf as well. Golf and tennis in my, that's a rich man's sport. I play tennis. 
Yeah. I go to yeah. the driving range. I'm not rich. Dan, you're doing all right, mate. Thanks, Tom. And ben, driving range is not the same thing. <laughs> So Eric began attending high school at Beverly Hills High, which sound, sounds like a dream. I'm thinking Clueless, the TV series. Mm. I'm thinking Saved by the Bell, perhaps, or The O.C. Fresh Prince. Mm, yeah. Yeah, because literally in the name, I couldn't, I couldn't dig you for that. So he, he on average grade... He tried, though. ...and displayed a remarkable talent for tennis, ranking 44th in the United States for 18 and unders players. And if he kept going at that traject- trajectory, um, he may have come up against the likes of Andre Agassi depending on how the tournament was seeded. We don't know. It is, it is a genuine possibility. Thank you. I, I don't know if the dates add up, but they might do. They might do. I don't know when Agassi <clears> was, <throat> it was in his prime. Let us know in the comments below if you, if you, if you care. Um, so, <laughs> so Lyle enrolled at Princeton University. However, during his freshman year, he was placed on academic probation because of low grades and poor attendance. Academic probation. It's a very fancy name for just being like... Where are you, Lyle? Um, and he was eventually suspended after plagiarism. Mm. We've all been there, copying and pasting Wikipedia things and changing certain words. With Eric being, you know, being a quite a success in tennis, being 44th ranked, he, he probably, Jose probably would want him to be at least in the 30s. Uh, but um, he, was, he was probably, you can imagine Jose was very disappointed and angry and let down that Lyle was getting, you know, accused of plagiarism and being suspended. Yeah, so doesn't start. doesn't look good on the family. Just as a bit of perspective here, they're living in a four million dollar pound mansion, twenty three rooms, twenty three rooms. Yeah, mm. good game of uh, Cluedo or hide and seek. I was thinking you're going with Cluedo. It'd be too long. Be too long. So would hide and seek with that many rooms. It, exactly. Forty forty. Fifty fifty. We play, I called it. I'll have twelve rooms. So Jose at this time was working in the entertainment industry. The video, the video business had really kicked off. Mm-hmm. Um, it was it was a very new thing, like blockbuster. You know, you hire out a, a video essentially, and he was he was top of the tree there, earning a million dollars every year. Um, and he was, you know, he was a, a very successful man. Yeah, and uh, it said that he was very much a cut your throat to get ahead uh, type of guy. Um, would happily intimidate or bully. Um, you know, uh, colleagues to get ahead, and uh, he was very, very driven. Perhaps, obviously, inherited from I think his it'd parents. Be fair to say, a lot of people didn't like him. Yeah, um, and as well in the industry, which is something I found quite quite fascinating, was the the video industry was originally kind of originated around pornography, like the internet. I guess um, it's, it's very much where it, that's where it grew, and um, when it started being more kind of commercial films, um, it, there was still some mob activity because pornography. Mm-hmm. A bit more mob activity in within there. Well, some foreshadowing. It, it may be said that you know he 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 could have made a few enemies on his way to the top as well. Um, you know, it's a fairly um, murky waters that he was swimming in. You never know on your way up who you need to be friendly with. That's why, like, when I come here, I high five Dan, stroke the dog, and let you sit next to me. And the thing that's important <laughs> to remember is on your way to the top. Be careful who you put down. Yeah. Because one day they could explode. Yeah. <laughs> Be a mess. Fucking and stink. God, no. <laughs> Jose then purchases a mansion in Calabasas, uh, California, and oof, it's it's a pretty picture, this house. It's, it's now that place is famously linked with the Kardashians, and it was on Elm Drive. Hmm. Nightmare on Elm Drive. Some foreshadowing there. Stop saying foreshadowing. When they move over to uh, Calabasas, they, the family have pet ferrets in the garden. Um, and to kind of demonstrate Jose's kind of alpha attitude here, uh, one day one of, the pet, one of the pet ferrets goes missing and is found dead. Um, all signs point to it being one of the family's pets, pet dogs. And Jose beheads the pet dog because of alleged ferret murder. I'll be on the dog side, but I'm more of a dog guy. I am on the dog side, yeah. Just Ferrets as well, a lot of the time. I'm not saying all ferrets, but when I've been near a ferret cage, it stinks of piss. But not saying it deserves what it got, but that's literally just an analysis. So this is quite a common thing. We, we've been a family with a lot of disposable income, getting anything you wanted, really. And I, and I don't think Jose supported them. Um, he didn't buy them absolutely everything they, they wanted, but he he you know they they wouldn't go wanting. They get they, they get very bored and they they're bored of being told you know, what to do. You know, do your studies, uh, train for the sport, 
and they start to break into the neighbors' houses. Mm. And it's not a case of just breaking in and stealing a couple things. They're stealing a thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of goods. Despite uh, the image of success, the boys were fighting a lot of inner demons, so they both had various health conditions growing up. They both faced issues with communication, so that, uh, Lyle in particular spoke with a stutter throughout his early childhood. They would often lash out in explosive acts of rage. Eventually, they were caught for all of these burglaries. Um, Jose didn't like the prospects of his boys facing any kind of criminal record. So um, he's trying at this point to convince the fellow neighbors, you know, not to press charges and not to go to court. It does end up going to court. However, because Eric is slightly younger and still a minor, um, they basically hire the best legal defense and they basically get Eric to plead guilty yeah. um, so that Lyle doesn't face like an adult conviction. Um, And in turn, Jose ends up paying off the neighborhood, essentially paying them back and then some. Yeah, he's only paying paying about $15,000, which is, I mean, obviously they've got the things back, I'm sure, but it's not in that kind of neighborhood, that's not much of a payoff. But yeah, Eric's taking the hit there, just so Lyle wasn't going to go to prison. And this was, and Jose would kind of have a little theme of using his money where where he needed to in order to make his, his boys reach where he needed them to go. He um, donated to Princeton University fifty thousand dollars, and that's to help Lyle get accepted. But um, he was quickly placed on academic probation because of lousy grades and disciplinary issues. His father tried to intervene again, but he was unable to buy his way out of that one. So that's, I mean, that must be if you're because it sounds of things already. Jose is quite scary. He's donated mm-hmm. fifty thousand pounds to get you there, and you've absolutely mucked it up. I wouldn't want to be going home if I was Lyle <clears throat> that day. Back in their um, early teenage years, um, the boys had one of their female cousins around the house, and at the time, um, Lyle was fourteen, Eric was eleven, and they end up wrestling with this female cousin. Escalate slightly, and they end up taking her clothes off and tying her to a bedpost. And then leaving her in the room. We yeah, this this case has basically um, a lot of uh, discussion about abuse, and there's a very much two sides uh, to people who know about this case who believe the Menendez brothers or who don't believe the Menendez brothers. But I think that in itself is is a sign of you know growing up in a household where sexuality and sexually explicit things have have, have has happened. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a lot of things to, uh, later on which might imply. Um, things are fabric- fabricated. It's, it's one of those. It's the people that will, would would know about this. Two of them are, are in jail, and two of them are no longer here. So it, it's it's hard to kind of say what's fabricated and what's not. So in, in 1982 as well, Lyle um, he wrote an essay when he was 14 about child molesters and a man who killed one and being sentenced to death. There's there's a online I've I've seen the document and it's it's, it's very it's a 14 year old writing about that particular topic is very very bizarre but it's essentially um, someone who's killed this child molester because they touched his son and then that person's being put to death for defending his family um, and it's it's a really bizarre thing for a child to be writing about again something that suggests they've they've hurt you well, know. they have knowledge of this subject yeah exactly so it's, it's quite an alarming thing even the teacher noted on it you know speaks to me off the class so as Tom mentioned Lyle was forced to flunk out of Princeton and at the time he and a um, high school sweetheart had big plans to open a restaurant together however um, based on the fact that he just flunked out the parents didn't approve of funding that dream so instead uh, Lyle ended up working for his dad at live entertainment and after a year's employment in his dad's company, he was fired. Um, now, there are definitely, definitely, a, you know, son of the boss references I can think of here. But in prepping, I froze and all I got was elf. Yeah. I think with with people who grow up in families of wealth, they either are born with a silver spoon and they, they have no work ethic or they are born and they are hungry for it. Not a lot of middle ground. So apparently um, Lyle would rarely show up to his job. Um, when he did show up, he was very disengaged and disinterested in the role, would often be late, would often rock up hungover, sometimes be fought, found falling, uh, having fallen asleep at the desk. Um, so eventually uh, Jose would turn around and fire him. Um, and imagine that family dinner that evening. Lyle was probably late. So again, the boys would continue to disappoint. I mean, more. it looks like on paper, at least, Lyle was more of a disappointment. But then he was supposed to be the, he was like the next Jose. In, in I Jose's think the, the, the firstborn son is usually one that you pass on the, man, the mantle to. Yeah. 
Um, well, he seemed to be the one that brought the most drama and uh, the most kind of uh, disappointment to uh, the parents. Um, and Eric and Lyle would then face further punishment when um, the parents said that they were going to cut them off. And when the parents said that, what did they decide to do? They start robbing from their parents and they end up stealing credit cards. So after disappointment, after disappointment, after disappointment, I do think Jose's, uh, his standards were very, very high. Um, the the boy, he did go on to write the boys out of the will. And this is a $14 million will. Ooh. So uh, that's, you know, that's just a sign. If, 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 a, if, if a parent is writing their own children out of the will, then that's a real, Something's in, happened. real indication that there's something awry. So Eric had, a, he had a bit of a creative streak within him. He, he did some modeling. Um, which his father, again, wasn't overly happy with. And Eric also started writing a script with his friend Craig Signorelli, which isn't a Craig... No, that's not that bizarre. He wrote a script. It's called Friends. And I was like, what? He Eric didn't. wrote Friends? He didn't. He, he created Ross, that comic character, Ross? But no, it was a script about a character called Hamilton who kills his parents for a big old inheritance. Big old payday. At this time, as we approach August 20th, 1989, um, there's a lot of turmoil. Tur turmoil? There's a lot of turmoil in the family, like. Turmoil. Yes. So at this time, there's a lot of turmoil within the family, and it's not just the two boys, Eric and Lyle. Um, Jose has actually uh, had multiple affairs, um, and cheated on Kitty on multiple occasions, and as a result, Kitty becomes suicidal and a manic depressive. Um, she also at this time, according to close friends, starts to believe that both of her children are psychopaths and uh, well, certainly sociopaths. So she begins locking herself in her own bedroom and not allowing the two boys to have their own key to the house. So following on from that, Jose would often see um, sex workers um, and he had some odd, he would be, apparently would be very savage with them and uh, a lot of times... Um, people would stop, you know, refuse to see him. He'd, he'd also ask for the girls to be no more than 13 years old and petite. One free? Yeah, one free. 13? Yeah, 13. That's still what one three is. Um, but the, obviously, you know, they, they weren't minors, so the, what the um, what the madam would do is give someone who looks a lot who looks a lot younger than they are. Um, but then, yeah, it was reported that he was very violent and he was known as being, you know, if girls would would be with him for the, for the night they would end up um, with bruised and scratched so the family is in a mess um, Kitty is locking herself in her, in her own bedroom the boys kind of have roam of the house but they don't have their own key and uh, Jose is often you know out of town on business or, or seeing sex workers and all this turmoil and drama would lead to this 911 call So August 20th, 1989, uh, the police now arrive in the Beverly Hills property and um, they find Lyle and Eric in quite an unusual state. So uh, Lyle is banging his head against a tree on the garden and uh, Eric is kind of laid in the fetal position on the, on the garden floor. Um, they eventually calm down and begin to explain that they've, well, calm down to a point and they begin to try and explain that they've just been uh, to the cinema just been to the movies to see Batman come back and found that their parents have been hideously murdered yes I mean yeah the way they were acting the police you know who knows how you'd react if you did go out and you came home and to find find your parents murdered the police were you know very much you know believing that something had been an intruder shots had been fired and you know they're looking into the case, thinking, you know, who done this? What, what, what's what's going on here? So the police were able to establish that the parents had had fallen asleep watching a James Bond movie in the den, and that Jose was shot at point blank range with a shotgun. Shotguns. I don't. I'm not. Neither. We've we've established neither of us are gun people. But I'm a gun person, Karen. So Jose was shot uh, point blank range from the top of his head downwards, and Kitty was awakened by the shots and got up from the couch. Um, she was covered in Jose's blood. She was shot in the right arm and the right leg while running toward the hallway, causing her to slip on her own blood and fall. And then afterwards, she was shot several times in the arm, chest, and face, leaving her unrecognizable. 
So this is a very brutal attack. Obviously, um, Jose was shot in, in the back of the head whilst he's asleep, so he didn't even he wouldn't have realised what was going on. And Kitty has run away, and, and she's been shot. They also had been kneecapped, so shot in the kneecaps, which is a very that's very linked with mob activity. As I mentioned before, we're in, in the video business, there's a lot of there's a lot of mob uh, behaviour. So the police were quick to kind of think, was this an organised hit? Was it something that um, Jose's done in, in his career, which has upset um, a crime syndicate? So shotguns, very, very powerful weapons, um, and especially at point blank range. Um, it was said that in in the attempt to kneecap Kitty, they actually broke, or this the individual actually broke her leg, um, and there was very little of their head and faces remaining um, after the attack. Yeah, so it's a very bloody attack. Um, it was reported Kitty's face, you know, obviously being shot in the head as well. Uh, that only, only had one eye remaining, and it was glassy eyed looking up. With the, with the look of fear in that eye. Um, so yeah, the police are there. They're talking to Lyle and Eric, trying to find out what's going on. These two these two children have lost their parents in, in a horrible attack. So the police are now thinking, let's look into um, Jose's uh, history. Let's see if there's any links here with, with any, we're basically upsetting the mob because it, it's very much what it indicated it was. Yeah, and nothing like this happened in that gated community. So it was a very kind of out of the blue attack. Um, and, you know, no initial obvious motive could be identified. Yes. Um, so the police are trying to ca calm the boys down. I mean, the 911 call handler as well doesn't do a great job of this because <laughs> she's, she, she just sounds so shocked by the call. Mm. So she's just like, who? Who did what? What? So uh, a gentleman called Les Zola was assigned to the case and um, he is essentially one of the top, top crime scene investigators of the time. Um, he examines the crime scene, notices that nothing has been uh, taken, there's no forced entry, um, and it did not to appear to have been a robbery. So while uh, Zola was investigating, he had a chance to catch up with Eric and Lyle. Now, Eric was completely unstable at this time. However, Lyle was very calm and composed. Um, he asked the boys if there's anyone out there that would potentially have a motive to harm or injure his parents, their parents. And the boys said, maybe the mob. Yeah. Which, yeah, it, as we said, it very much looked like um, it could be a mob hit. The coroner determined that the shot to her left knee came from a different angle from the other shots, so the killers may have been staging the murder to look like a mob job. And killers there as well. Salah so and Eric here, they've lost their parents. They've, you know, they've had people come into the house and kill their parents. So they're in a situation now where they're, you know... <laughs> It's such a change in their life. They're not sure what to do with it. You know, you're grieving. What do you do? Mm -hmm. You've suddenly, as well, you've suddenly got all this wealth. But what do you do? Obviously, you're gonna you're gonna be uh, mourning, or are you gonna go on a spending spree? Mm. Tough question. There's certain behaviours you as you imagine uh, people who are grieving would go through, and uh, everyone copes with things in different ways. But this behaviour that we're about to go into is slightly bizarre. Yeah, and obviously the media, are so, it's a big, big event that a Hollywood executive is, uh, has been murdered um, in, in a, you know, a peaceful community. Um, so the media is a very prominent, you know, who done it uh, in the media at the time. So the boys now go on a bit of a spending spree, as Tom said. On the day before um, his parents' funeral, Lyle spent over $15,000 on free Rolex watches. So that's the first thing on their list. Yeah. So as you mentioned earlier, Ben, with Lyle wanting to work in the restaurant biz, he decided this was the time to strike. Um, he went to um, Princeton and he, he bought a popular student restaurant, Chuck's Spring Street Cafe, for $550,000 and renamed it Mr. Buffalo's after its spicy wings. Mm. You like a spicy wing, do you? Love a spicy wing. Well, there you go. So he bought that, and he's now in the he's now in the restaurant biz. And uh, as we mentioned before, with with Eric, a very keen tennis player, mm -hmm. he's then hiring a tennis coach for sixty thousand dollars a year in hopes to go pro. It's a good rate. So in the documentary I saw of the tennis coach, uh, he was very involved with, within the family as well. Um, the, he was one of the first people that called after the after finding their parents to get them over to the house, and he found yeah he found the boys in the in the state as well. So they spent a lot of money quickly. They've also bought a Porsche for sixty thousand dollars and spent forty thousand pounds on clothes. So people around around the brothers and around the boys have started to think this is unusual behaviour. Mm -hmm. um, they're living kind of the uh, playboy playboy lifestyle. Yeah, they moved out of the family home as well, which which which. Are, I understand. You wouldn't want to be in that. I mean, it's a mansion, there's lots of rooms, but even so, you wouldn't want to be on that same site. But they're living out of luxury hotels now. Um, one potential, one particular stay, um, they rent out 
um, condominiums on the water in Marina del Rey and their adjoining apartments had ample room for parties and movie nights with friends. <laughs> well, there you go. Ample room indeed. So apparently at the funeral, the boys, you know, they... they, they they looked the part. They were, you know, obviously very distraught. They were very sombre. They spoke very well of their parents at the funeral. And then on the way from the funeral to the wake, um, one of the friends said the wake was very disturbing because the boys turned into the kind of the hosts that were hosting a party rather than, you know, still kind of honouring their parents. But Mitzi, who is Jose's assistant, who was in the uh, in the limo with Lyle on the way to the wake, said, and Lyle, I think this is the most partridge line ever, said, I'm filling my father's shoes. And Mitzi said, you can make your own way in the world. And Lyle said, no, you don't understand. Pointed down at his feet, said, these are literally my father's shoes. Which <laughs> is absolutely absurd. Um, but maybe, maybe a bit of light relief. And apparently on, from, from pointing to the shoes, he's then kind of face out of the window. How can I get tickets to the US Open? Which had already sold out at the time. Oh. So it's it's... Very bizarre behaviour. As I said, people can mourn in different ways, but they seem to be, you know, that you would be. You could look at that and say they suddenly are living their best life. Yeah, Eric, having paid his respects, uh, got his brand new Rolex uh, tennis coach. He heads off to the Middle East to go to uh, a t- essentially a tennis training camp. Well, Ben, who sponsors Wimbledon? It all adds up. Rolex. Yeah. What up, Ben? Eric is now, you know, playing tennis for 10 hours a day in the Middle East. Uh, Lyle heads off to not only, uh, uh, you know, develop this restaurant that he's purchased, but he wants to now kind of build up a portfolio of different businesses. An empire. Yes. Um, So they launch Menendez Investment Enterprises. And there's an interesting quote at the time as well. Uh, And again, it's, it's they build up a bit of a portfolio of restaurants, real estate, just like their father. Um, but Lyle, when conducting an interview with the local student magazines for the Princeton University of acquiring uh, Mr. Buffalo's restaurant, he said, um, it was one of my mother's delights that I pursue a small restaurant chain and serve healthy food with a friendly service. I mean, buffalo wings aren't that healthy. No, I love them. So during this time, it's very obvious that Lyle, you know, as I said, he was living his best life. But with Eric, there's actually signs, you know, he, that he you know, he was suffering a little bit. He had lost a lot of weight. He was re- he regularly would cry and break down, and he just wasn't acting acting himself. As I said, you know, of, of course, you're not going to act yourself after such a horrible thing and finding your parents in such an awful way. But he started to see a therapist at this point. Yes, and that was Doctor Jerome Oziel. So whilst. Um Whilst seeing therapists and giving various, you know, media interviews that, I mean, they're being um, viewed by the nation as these children that have gone through unbelievable, despite their, you know, their their financial fortune, unbelievable bad fortune. Um, So when giving an interview, Eric states that his brother's dream is still to be involved in politics. And he says, my brother wants to become president of the US. I want to be his senator and I want to be with the people of Cuba. Um, he said, in tribute to their, their father, Jose, who had been born in Cuba, I'm not going to live my life for my father, but I think his dreams are what I want to achieve. I feel he's in me, pushing me. Yeah, there's, there's reports that apparently his, their father, um, Jose, wanted to actually become get politics himself. He wanted to liberate Cuba as well. So I think, yeah, that, that's what they kind of get going on there. The fact that he had those dreams, but they wanted to do it slightly differently. But, they, you know, they had very high aspirations, especially for people who weren't, I'm not saying in politics you need to be very well educated, but they, they for someone who didn't have much drive when it came to, to um, school and education, they wanted to go on and basically, in some ways, I would have thought as well, maybe oh, uh, maybe achieve more than they far, their father yeah. had. Yeah, outshine him. So Eric would see Dr. Azil on a regular basis and, you know, kind of try and deal with the, the, um, the terror of finding his parents in that way. And then he would eventually go on to reveal something which was a rather disturbing thing to hear. Eric dropped the ball a little bit while Lyle was away, kind of um, building up this portfolio and going to parties. So Eric would reveal in a uh, one-on-one session with Dr. Ozil that that they had both, in fact, been responsible for the murders, the brutal murders of their parents. Yes, I think there was... Dr. Ozil kind of was feeling there was something wasn't quite right. Obviously, long long conversations with him, and also the fact to have their boys had been behaving, and you know he was displaying things which were which were of guilt. Um, so, 
yeah, I think you know he managed to get, get this out of Eric. Maybe not as difficultly as you would have imagined. Um, and once um, Eric tells Lyle he's done this, Lyle's very, obviously very angry. Can't believe it, yeah. Um, but he would end up going to see Dr. Ezeal himself, and he'd go on to <laughs> basically reaffirm what Eric has said. Um, do we, you think he went there with the intention to do that, or do you think he went there to say, right, you know what, Eric's going through a lot, he's he, not in his right mind. Just sound like, this is a comfy sofa. Yeah, well, oh, well, this coffee tastes great. <laughs> I think I want to tell you something. <laughs> I did not expect this. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Touché, Mr. Ozio. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, Dr. Ozio, yeah. sorry. Um, yes, we actually did it. So yeah, he would actually come out and back up what... Um, what Eric had said, and he he basically yeah said said we did it, and he even said the phrase we committed the perfect murder. My father would be proud. Now the boys at this point as well. Like, but can we just my father would be proud. He's just killed his dad, but my father would be proud of the way we killed him. Which that in itself is, I think Doctor Hill probably was like that is I can't even undo that. That is fucked up. So a big part of this, the boys, uh, well Eric firstly had had kind of questioned um the patient doctor patient confidentiality bond um wherein i guess he was convinced or or led to believe that you know whatever's said in between these four walls you know stays between us and eric obviously uh lyle sorry has also gone there with the same intent so um doctor Azil, obviously he was able to get this out get this information out of the boys and then he even will get them to agree to them him actually recording the sessions as we said there, i think there's a bit of confusion on the boys part thinking maybe it was all confidential um yeah but then dr Ozil had a different plan he he would feel intimidated by obviously he's got these two people who have cold heartedly killed their parents and he gets his mistress to pretend to be a patient outside and eavesdrop on the boys and she said she didn't know what evil was until she heard what those boys had to say that's the thing so under what pretense has he explained that recording it will be a benefit is that therapy um guys uh, you know it um i've got tennis elbow uh so i can't write this down so do you mind if i just record this one and you guys have got great voices it's going to sound fantastic um, so do you mind uh but basically this is this is the moment which you know the police actually apparently were monitoring the boys behavior and did kind of see there was the way they're behaving isn't the way you would behave so they were kind of starting to close in on the boys and think you know what what's going on here but this would just go on to kind of really establish them with a firm case against the guys so now we're going to go back on the timeline and just basically say what actually happened yeah rather than what the media were led to believe what happened So, August 18th, 1989, two days before the murders, Eric and Lyle Menendez purchased shotguns at the Big Five Sporting Goods chain store in San Diego, over a hundred miles away from their family's mansion in Beverly Hills. Big Five Sporting Goods chain just sounds like Sports Direct. Imagine being able to buy guns in Sports Direct. Well, that's basically it, what they have over there. You can get guns in... um, Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Costco. Yeah. They're just saying it's what's the other one? Just saying it's a sorry state of affairs. Walmart, was it? Walmart, yeah, yeah. So we agreed the guns are yeah, cool. Um, August nineteenth, nineteen eighty nine. Ben Carter was born. <laughs> uh, so it's a really sad day for everyone involved. Um, joke. Welcome. How was that day? So August 19th, 1989, Kitty and Jose chart a yacht and the Menendez family go on a family fishing trip. It is alleged the family do not speak to one another on this trip. Jose at the back of the boat, Kitty below deck and the boys up front. Good formation. So as we mentioned before, um, Jose and Kitty were sitting on a couch in their den watching one of the latest James Bond movies to the point where they fell asleep. Um, Eric and Lyle enter the side of the house via the study and make their way towards the den carrying shotguns. Um, while they're both asleep, Jose was shot point blank in the head as well as in the, well, I don't think it was in this precise order, in the elbow, the arm, the back of the head, and then point blank on the top of the head downwards, um, killing him immediately. So obviously the sound of the shotgun blast um, killing Jose, uh, Kitty's awoken, she's seeing you know, what should I imagine this? She wake up, wakes up, and sees her son killing her husband, which it would be quite the sight. She's obviously panicked. She doesn't know what's going on. She, she's making a run for it. So the boys would go and follow her and shoot her. One of the horrible things that I, I read about this case is the boys had to reload in order to actually kill her because they shot her multiple times, but she wasn't actually dead by this stage. So they had to go outside, reload, go in, and then shoot her. As I said before, the, the ammo was in the car. So a total of fifteen shots are fired. So this is a shotgun, and like yeah. like Ben said earlier, shotguns are loud, aren't they, Ben? They're loud and they're powerful. Exactly. So in that gated community, 15 shots, 
no no call to the police. Yeah. It is a very, very peculiar thing. Yeah, now there was a teenage girl who did see um see two men enter the house, but as she recognized them as Eric and Lyle, yeah. there was, you know, no concerns raised. Um, and another thing to note, obviously Kitty in the weeks and months building up to her her death was obviously very concerned about Eric and Lyle. She believed that they were, you know, sociopaths. She believed that they were dangerous. She was locking herself in her own room. So she wakes up to the shock of seeing um, Jose killed. Um, and then she is put through absolute hell by these two boys. It's, so there's 15 shots in total and 11 of them are at her. Yeah, so the, the boys would then go go from here and they'd go off to go to the movies themselves, obviously to give themselves an alibi, and then come home and find the scene and then make the call for the police. The, it, it was said in interviews afterwards, the boys kind of expected the police would be there by the time they, they got there um, because, obviously, of the of the, of the, uh, the shots. But um, they had to ring the police themselves and that's where Lyle would go on to do his... Yeah, some people say the Oscar-worthy performance down the phone, crying down the phone. So... Eric and Lyle make a point of uh, picking up all of the shotgun shell casings and uh, driving up Mulholland Drive in order to toss their shotguns and the shells into a canyon. Um, They return to the house and make the uh, subsequent 911 police call. So March 3rd, 1990, and there is some conjecture here. Now, the uh, the mistress of Dr. Ozeal, who uh, we had mentioned, um, was being used to kind of... uh, be a witness first of all while the boys while the boys were in uh, therapy but also it's alleged that she became enraged when Dr. Ozil broke up with her and ended up eventually going to the police informing them that the Menendez brothers had been seeing Ozil for f- psychiatry and had actually confessed to killing their parents and controversy would later arise over whether patient therapist confidentiality laws applied to the tapes that Ozil had made of the brothers confessions it was eventually ruled that patient doctor confidentiality had been broken when Eric threatened Ozeal's life and some of the tapes would be considered admissible evidence. Yes, so Eric would say, go on to say, you know, if you say anything about this. You'd expect that from Lyle. Yeah, that, that's something that changes throughout this case in terms of who actually is kind of the more the lead on this. But um, subsequently, Lyle is arrested on suspicion of killing his parents on March 8th, 1990, and the authorities await the return of Eric, who's actually playing a tennis tournament in Israel. Um, March 11th, when Eric returns, he's arrested at Los Angeles International Airport on returning. So on the same day, March 11th, 1990, Eric gives a statement to the media. Um, Maybe if we were there, we could have protected them. I have never seen my dad hurt or in weakness. I would have given my life for that man. Um, Which just in hindsight is kind of grim. It also uh, comes to light that over the course of the six months since their parents were murdered, the boys reportedly spent one million dollars on parties, travel and shopping. So in March 12th, 1990, the murder charges are filed against Eric and Lyle. The district attorney, Ira Rayner, says the two killed their parents in hopes of inheriting an estate estimated to be worth about 14 million dollars. December 8th, 1992, Eric and Lyle are indicted for murder. So in a lot of these documentaries or anything you, you watch, it's always interesting to see the lawyers that they use. Mm-hmm. Their defence attorney, Leslie Abramson, is quite the character and she does a lot of, is she the way she is with the boys she's very kind of motherly with them um, and you know she was very aware that this is a big case and there was something reported that she was signed off for a million dollars straight away to take this case and um, you know she kind of would play very play very well with the media in terms of making the boys look a certain way making them wear sweaters in the courtroom to, because it's, you know you trust someone in a sweater more than you do a man in a suit a boy in a sweater to make them dress very preppy kind of play on the fact that they're quite handsome boys to try and you know even get people to kind of think they couldn't possibly have done this yeah. so she it would cut there'd be more to talk about her later on but she was a very kind of feisty uh, defense attorney yeah and with the money available to the Menendez brothers at the time, you would assume that they would only hire the best and, you know, a million dollars just to take, you know, the initial sign-on fee. So, July 20th, 1993, opening statements begin in the brothers' trial. Prosecutors accuse the brothers of premeditated murder while defence lawyers provide sordid descriptions of greed and sexual abuse. Um, So, at the time... You know, the boys outright prior to this had denied any involvement whatsoever. The pivotal moment is when everything suddenly changes and now defence are going with the angle that it was, okay, they did it, but it was in defence and this is why. Yeah, yeah, so 
There's lots and lots. This is one of the, quite. An, this this whole court case was broadcast on on the Crime Network, um, and you know it had the th- the viewing figures were absolutely crazy. It, it's it's a case where, yeah, it it seems this is where it really it really parts opinion in terms of they use they use the term the ab- abuse excuse uh, because it's something so heinous and horrible that, that how could you possibly lie about it? They thought that they were just using you know this came out of nowhere. There was no mention of it before, um, and they thought they were just using this to try and you know justify the horrible things they'd done. Yeah, they also had to get two separate juries, which I, I've not heard of before. Yeah, for Eric and Lyle, they had, they had the, it was the same courtroom, just had two separate juries for each brother, which yeah, and two separate sweaters. Yeah, weirdly, the brothers didn't wear the same sweater at the same time. Yeah. Um, that's my point. Yeah. Point. Yeah, that's my point. August 10th, 1993, Dr. Azil testifies that the brothers confessed in 1989 in their sessions that they had killed their parents. So, December 3rd, 1993, testimony in the brothers' trial ends after the presentation to 101 witnesses, including the emotional accounts of Eric and Lyle over nearly five months. So these are the bits that, that are really the headline images when you watch any documentaries or you, you listen to any podcasts about them. It's the testimonies themselves. They're very dramatic, but it depends on which side of the fence you're sat on. Yeah, a lot of people said when, when they're in the courtroom, um, they, you know, they were in tears themselves watching it and listening to what they had to say. But on reflection, watching back the footage, they just thought they were acting. Um, so... Um, so Lyle would go on to say that the abuse he suffered at the hands of his father um, and how, uh, you know, he, that even like while I was growing up and developing and you know, learning about sex, that would lead on to him even going on to abuse his brother, Eric. Mm-hmm. So it was, it was it, the when you watch the footage itself, I, I watched it and with this case, like I said, there's two very, it's very two clear sides. You're either on the side that they were abused when they were younger and therefore you kind of think, well, not giving them a justified cause for doing this, but you kind of think oh, that's their motive. That's the reason they've done it, because mm-hmm. they're they're claiming that they always grew up scared. They're always fearful of their parents, and this is why they committed the crime. Is what they're trying to trying to say. Um, but the other angle of it was this is the only way they could possibly get out of this. Um, yeah, and it also came out of nowhere. There's some there's other bits of evidence which kind of allude to the fact that this, this could have gone on. The fact that apparently Jose would go to the bedrooms at parties, not want anyone else to be near the rooms. There's there's lots of reports which kind of indicate there's something. That they could have gone on um, but then as I said other experts have looked at it and think it's it's completely untrue um, because their you know their pockets were endless they were able to get experts in experts within the field of abuse and they were able to kind of testify and say yes this is a clear sign that this has happened but the um, the prosecution didn't have any kind of real budget and they weren't able to kind of use these experts I mean the prosecution actually used a term that um, the people coming in, they, they were bought, they were, you know, they, they'd been paid this money, you know, you need to come in and say this. Yeah. And essentially, they were coming in as witnesses and basically just saying exactly what the um, defence needed them to say. Yeah, and in hindsight, if you don't know the outcome of the, the case, it's very much, you're watching it and you think, they're, they're going to get away with this. I, when I first watched it and watched them in court, I thought that I believed what they said and I thought, oh, they, but they've killed their father... Oh, that makes, explains why they killed their father because he, he abused yeah. them growing up. But then what about the mother? Yeah, it doesn't explain that. Then they go on to say that you know she knew about the abuse. She never stopped never it. Never stopped it. And so the so you kind of if you listen to what the boys are saying, you're very much thinking, okay, the father abused them, um, but why the mother? And then there's a, an odd story. Um, if you look at pictures of of Lyle, Lyle and Eric, um, the the hair looks very different. Um, basically, Lyle had a a wig, a toupee. Um, and which I don't, I never clocked it until watching this documentary. Yeah. And a lot of people in the documentary said it's a great wig. You couldn't believe it. Um, but apparently, Eric had no idea that even though they're thick as thieves, brothers, he they had no idea about it. At one time, apparently, the mother, close up to the to the murder, actually pulled Lyle's hairpiece off, and then revealed it to Eric. And he found that he found that so traumatizing and so embarrassing that he had to kill her. <laughs> So when Eric discovered his brother had a wig, which he didn't know apparently, even though they were very, very close, um, because he was could see how ashamed he was, that's when Eric was able to come clean to his brother and say that Jose had been abusing him for, for many years, and that's when they both kind of bonded and discussed what had been happening to them, and that's when they kind of realised in their head they need to do something about this. It, it still splits opinion. There are still people that believe to this day the boys are uh, innocent or innocent in, in acting the, the way that they did. Um, definitely divided opinion at the time and it was on as Tom said the crime network it, it, it was fascination for the, the whole world at the time the whole country were 
boys. Enraptured by it. Yeah, so the boys, you know, they go, they go up there, they testify themselves, they talk about what they've been through, they cry, but apparently there's reports from the bailiffs that they, after these days in court, they'll high-five each other about them being doing well in the docks. So it's kind of like, not very, sometimes they just display, you know, they, they could, as well, the reason why people were, you know, if they didn't go and spend these elaborate, if they didn't go on these elaborate spending sprees and go and admit to the doctor what they've done, mm-hmm. that then they wouldn't have been the ones they're still be looking for the mob yeah it's the timing of it all it nearly was the perfect moment so January 13th 1994 Superior Court Judge Stanley Weisberg declares a mistrial after jurors are basically they're deadlocked after 19 days and they can't come to a verdict that seems 19 days is a you're sitting in there in an the air conditioned room getting the meals brought to you mm. uh, I don't know today Maybe. I'm not sure Hmm, what sandwiches are there? Oh, <laughs> I'll have like, another one. Oh, come on. <laughs> no, seriously, I don't know, actually. Yeah, get them in Ozil's chair, they'll make their minds up real quick. <laughs> I took the extra sandwiches, Ozil. <laughs> so jurors are essentially split between first and second degree murder and voluntary manslaughter charges. They are also split on charges of conspiracy to commit murder. So there's a lot of uh, deadlock going on at the moment. So at this point... Um, Uh, the mistrial has been declared the boys are starting to feel like they've got away with it as Tom said a lot of high fives outside the courthouse which again if your parents have just been murdered a few years ago just been murdered a few years ago (laughs) so uh, June 29th 1994 the judge says that he wants to retry Eric and Lyle before one jury seems like the the easier route there I don't know why you would let's bring even more chaos into this October 11th 1995 in opening statements prosecutors say the brothers plan to kill their parents to get their hands on the family fortune while Eric's lawyer counters that that the two killed in self-defense after years of horrific abuse so so the uh, defense uh, attorney would say go on to say Eric was still being sexually abused at, what at 18 mm-hmm. um, and you know he was always fearful of his father um, and so that's why the kind of self-defense thing is it's coming into play there they didn't feel safe around their parents yeah whereas at that point Lyle had said no more mm-hmm. um but he was wanting to save his brother as well from going through further abuse. So January 9th, 1996, Eric concludes several weeks of testimony telling the jury that he believes his wealthy father was a killer who had killed before and threatened to kill his children. Um, Defence lawyers rested their case uh, the following week um, without even calling Lyle to the stand. Yes, yeah, because Lyle has had certain things which they were able to impeach him for, so they weren't willing to put him on, on the defence because they thought he would kind of trip himself up and get, get himself into further issues there. February 16th, 1996, Judge Weisberg effectively bars the jury from returning manslaughter verdicts for the slaying of Kitty, but allowed the jury to return a manslaughter verdict for Jose's death. He also rules the jurors won't be able to consider the brothers' claim that they killed because they believe their parents are about to kill them. It feels like Weisberg is a little bit like, okay, no, we're going to change the rules here because we need to change them to finish this case. It's gone on far too long. You can't do that, can't do that, can't do that. It's Play ball. Yeah, he's like, it seems like, yeah, he's just changing. Yeah, they weren't allowed to bring certain, I know they weren't allowed to bring certain... Um, certain witnesses to the stand as well in this case um like we said before with, with the friend's script beforehand he was brought on he was brought on to be questioned before you know with the idea of the inheritance and you know, it's a clear link to what the story was but certain people were completely you can't bring them on no like, you can't do this anymore it's my ball it's my game we're, we're playing it like this so february 29th 1996 lawyers wrap up eight days of closing arguments Eight days. That's a lot of arguing. That's a lot of closing arguing. With prosecutors calling the defence a hoax and defence attorneys pleading with the jury to be lenient. As I said, the abuse excuse which was being touted as, as what they were using there. So March 1st, 1996, the jury begins its deliberations after hearing nearly five months of testimony. So March 20th, 1996, the jury convicts both brothers of first degree murder with special circumstances. April 5th, 1996, Eric's lead defence attorney, Leslie Abramson, invokes her Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination, refusing to answer the judge's questions about possible evidence tampering. So this was... It was a clerical error, um, and one of the people, one of her witnesses, who essentially he had written some notes up. She had pressured him, going, "These notes aren't good enough. You need to change them." So he 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 folded to the pressure, and he did change them. But when he was given, because both the defence and the prosecution, they all need to be given the paper evidence beforehand because they need to know what's coming up, and they can't be sprung upon them essentially. But there's a clerical error where the uh, the um, where the prosecution were given the unedited notes. 
and he was reading his notes. Yeah. So it, it was, the judge was basically, whilst he was on the stand, this doctor, they were like, these don't add up, these have been edited and changed. And he had to admit on the stand that I was told by the lawyer to change these notes. So essentially, he's completely she done it there. there. Yeah, she, yeah, and then she's like, oh, I want to play the fifth. Um, so that was... Imagine, I, can, I can imagine the anxiety of that doctor going, oh, it's like if you copy and paste a Wikipedia thing and leave a little blue <laughs> link in it. You're like, oh, crap. Um, so, yeah, that was uh, exactly what happened there. there. As I said, she was a character. Um, just to go off a little bit of a tangent, tangent after this, she, she took four of the female jurors out for a meal um, and she would, she would also would book them to be on, on shows, to TV shows. She would kind of act yeah. as the agent a little bit afterwards. And after the meal, when she cooked for them at her house, um, she uh, actually gave them access to speak to Eric on the phone when he was in prison. How is that? Uh, yeah, it's absolutely baffling. But she was... she Collusion? <laughs> is that she one? was very feisty and a, and a bit of a character. Wow. Uh, so April 9th, 1996, the judge rules that Abramson can remain on the case after four days of hearings um, and a final private meeting with Eric. Earlier, Abramson said she would have waived her Fifth Amendment right. So she as well, by this stage, as we said before, when she started the case, she got paid a million up front. And this stage, she's getting paid 10,000, I think it's a month, which still very good money. But mm. yeah, there's just showing the kind of the family fortune is dwindling here. Not selling enough spicy wings. Apparently. April 15th, 1996, the jury begins its deliberations to determine whether Eric and Lyle should be sentenced to the death penalty or life prison terms. April 17th, 1996, the jury recommends life in prison without the possibility of parole. Yeah. So the whole story, you know, is said, it's like a soap opera. It's like a soap opera. It's been on TV. They've seen the brothers. As I said, they're you know, quite handsome brothers. They, they've cried on the stand. There's been um, controversy with the with jury, controversy with the lawyers. It's all been kind of like... It's, it's a mess. Yeah, it's a mess. It's, it's a mess. Yeah, and it's all resolved here. So after going through all of this, going through the court case together, going through, it depends what you believe, the abuse, um, it, the, the brothers were, at this stage, they were to be separated and sent to different prisons. Uh, which for them they found very very hard. There, there's an interview with Barbara Walters with the two brothers. Even that is, is a case of they're interviewing her in a, with a talk show host talk, and she grills them, Barbara oh, Walters. Yeah. And there, you know, she she asks the question, um, which we'll play now. She asks essentially, "What if they decide to separate you two? And uh, it's very interesting to hear the kind of answer there. Some people might say, why should we put them together? I mean, look what they did. They should be punished as much as possible. Let's separate them. What do you say to that? There's, there's nothing to say to that. Um, what we did it was awful, um, and I wish I could go back. We will spend the rest of our life in prison. But if, I'm not, if, I'm not, if we're not put in the same prison, uh, there's a good probability I will never see him again. Some things that you cannot take, and there's some things that you can endure. Uh, with everything taken away, it would be the last, uh, you know, it's the last thing you can take. So yeah, Barbara Walters, good on you, Gil. So Jamie Pisarczyk, a prosecution witness, said that Lyle told her that his mother had sexually abused him. So there's also, yeah, there's links here which kind of is trying to justify and explain why this had happened. And in the trial, this is quite an interesting quote, Lyle said, there was no way I was going to make a decision to kill my mother without Eric's consent. I was going, I didn't even want to influence him in that issue. I just let him sleep on it for a couple of days. And a lot of people felt a lot of sympathy toward them because of the, uh, the claims of abuse. Uh, they didn't struggle to, you know, they got lots, they got thousands upon thousands of letters from people. And they, uh, they would go on to, whilst behind bars, go on to marry. Um, Lyle got married to Anna Erickson in 1996 to 2000 and to 2001 because he actually ended up cheating on her. Even though there's no conjugal visits, he started writing love letters to Rebecca Sneed, and the and the the guards realised that he, he was cheating on <laughs> cheating on Anna and actually sent her the post instead. <laughs> so they ratted him out, and then he he would go on to marry Rebecca Sneed later on instead. But Eric, um, he's he got married to to Tammy Ruth Sackerman in 1998 yeah because throughout this case and throughout a lot of the documentaries we've watched um you know eric's sexuality came into question a few times um there was uh some accusations that he was gay for uh, had gay experiences throughout his teenage years um and and this is why his father targeted him but i don't know 
again if yeah, there's much it, less to that. Exactly. A lot of this is the, the confusing thing with this case. There's lots of different things, obviously lawyers, uh, techniques, and they're trying to kind of back up the story as to why they would do such a thing. There's a lot of conjecture and kind of theories as to why the brothers are going to do this. Um, but yeah, currently now, yeah, they're both married and the brothers were actually moved into the same prison in February 2018. Um, during that time, they'd talk to each other via, each, via the wives, but they'd also play chess one move at a time over a letter. Wow. That's one way to pass the time. Really thinking about the next move, though. Imagine if you yeah. do that, you fuck up. Like, oh. <laughs> so just a little bit of trivia here. Uh, the house where they lived was formerly owned by Elton John and Michael Jackson. And it had since passed through two owners after the fateful night in 1989. A murder house, as I said, I think it's probably cheaper than a normal house. One of the things I brought up in series one, I think in maybe the first episode. Well, you're going to love this. Oh, go on, Ben. It was bought by a murder mystery TV writer, William Link, until 2001, where he then sold it to a telecommunications executive, Mr. Sam DeLue. Um, in December 2018, eBay began terminating any live auctions in which the uh, Mark Jackson basketball NBA hoops trading card was listed. This is because uh, the Menendez brothers are featured in uh, in this card in the background and this is um, during their spending spree so oh, they had okay. gone to a, a basketball game uh, but they were fetching some fairly large fees okay cool yeah there's also the very famous it hasn't aged well there's an SNL sketch um, it, the dislikes there are it's because it's it's very un PC regarding um, mental health um but it's got john malkovich it's got michael myers it's or mike myers not, it's not got the guy from halloween um but it's not aged well it's still on youtube you can still watch it um but it's yeah it's a fairly it's done in fairly bad taste yeah them crying on the stand and poking fun at abuse um yeah an interesting thing that emerged about kitty menendez was six weeks before she was killed she told her therapist she was hiding sick and embarrassing secrets and according to Robert Rand's book, Kitty's sister, Joan, told Rand that she believed Kitty may have been abused when she was a young girl. Mm -hmm. And that's what she could be referring to when she said sick and embarrassing. Um, although this has been disputed because due to psychologists' input that if you feel sick and disgusted still as an adult, it's usually by something that you have responsibility for doing as an adult. So they're thinking that, you know, she may have been implicit if there was any kind of abuse going on. And that would explain... You know, kind of back up the brother's story. So, um, again, it's very much clear two camps, um, but I'd recommend watching the court footage and seeing what you think yourself. Have you got a lookalike, Ben? Yeah, they're not great this week. <laughs> so, I think my Eric is the most obvious one. I think most people would get it. Eric looks like Gareth Bale. Oh, uh, that is good. I have, I have Tim Henman. Tennis? Yeah, tennis. But that Bale is, yeah, Bale is a good shout. Lyle looks like Sam out of Lord of the Rings. I think it's Sam. <laughs> yeah, Samwise Ganji. Yeah, Samwise Ganji out of Lord of the Rings. Thank you. You could do lots of things with potatoes, Smiggle. Mr. Frodo. Fucking awesome. Which one? Both. Oh. Oh, I've got Lyle. This one, it will be for, for <laughs> not many people will know who I'm talking about here. Uh, Lyle looks like Phil Everly from the Everly Brothers. I've been waiting 19 episodes to find someone that looks like this, and I've found two of them. In their own what? very different ways, um, Eric and Lyle look like the type of people that when you try to overtake them on a motorway, they speed up. So annoying. They're doing 60, you go to overtake, they're then doing 90. Hang on, they look like the type that would speed up if you overtake them. Trying to overtake them. So if you, if you try to overtake someone on a dual carriageway or a motorway, and then all of a sudden they speed up. You're basically just saying they look like dickheads. They do look like dickheads. They look like, in very different ways, if you tried to overtake them, they wouldn't like it, so they'd speed up. That's all I'm trying Sounds to like say. Sounds like you got a chip on your shoulder about Maybe it. Maybe I have. Anyway, that was the case of the Menendez brothers. Two sides of the camp here. You can either be on, you know, believe in them or not. Um, I, for, as I said, throughout the case, I kind of flip flop between what I believed. There's lots of little bits of evidence that prove that that go on to kind of back up what they were saying. And then a lot of the experts say that it was merely an excuse. Well, it, do you do you ever? Where did you fall on the on the, on the line here? I, I, it's very easy to believe that they were going to be cut out of the will, so they acted rashly and quickly. As I said, like it goes, to, it seems to, to line up that if they just didn't go on a spending spree and they um, didn't 
admit to killing their parents, yeah, they probably would high five and outside the courtroom. Yeah, all these things did did not help their case whatsoever. But they're together now after after a long time in prison, and uh, yeah, just goes to show you money can't buy you everything. Exactly, Ben. Exactly. And uh, but if you want to sign up to our Patreon, uh, it can buy you uh, episodes you haven't seen before. Twenty and, episodes you haven't seen before. Oh, twenty! That's a good number, isn't it? Ben? Yeah. If you've enjoyed today's episode, give us a little like and a little subscribe here on YouTube, and why not hit the notification bell just so you you never miss an episode. As always, you can hit us up on the socials, which for everything is at Could Murder a Pod. If you're listening on audio, please give us a follow on Spotify, or if you're on Apple iTunes, why not give us a review and a rating? We always it's always nice to see a little review and, and see what you have to say, and it helps us a lot with more people seeing us and seeing the podcast. Yeah, and if you're an audio listener or a YouTube viewer, and and we don't know who you are, come and say hello to us somewhere. We've we've got Twitter, we've got Instagram. You can get onto the YouTube comments. If you're a person that watches us on YouTube, I do this all the time. Um, and you just watch content but stay, stay quiet in the background that's fine if you want to do that but also say hello to us tell us something why, why you've stuck around or why you if this is the first time you've ever seen us Menendez Brothers fair enough yeah and on Instagram give us, give us a little DM if anyone ta- if you're listening or you're watching it and you tag us in a story we 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 give you a bloody share because we really generally appreciate the support but yeah we'd love to hear from you if, you, if you're a long time viewer and you've been around for a while, let us know who you are. What's what's your story? What's what's going on in your life? And um, we've got some new things in our merch store now. We've got hats, we've got tote bags, we've got mugs. So any support there, we appreciate. We even got a bundle deal, which is mm. we keep thinking, well, have we got is this have we fucked that bit? Because <laughs> the bundle deal looks too good to be true, but we're keeping it up there. So crack on, crack on. Yeah. So thank you so much as always, and uh, keep telling your friends and your family about us, and we will see you very very soon and like we always say we say this quite a lot keep doing what you know just keep doing on unless it's um parents uh, uh parenticide is it parenticide Paren- parasite you didn't, you didn't come prepared <laughs> <laughs> see, until next time see ya